I would really like to welcome to our stage. Water supplies. 
contamination of farmland in Massachusetts now. There are many local stores that are not importing Pennsylvania-grown produce because of some of the concern about the frack chemicals. The cost of taxpayers for public infrastructure and cleanup, the air pollution. Now we're finding out that earthquakes have been linked in Oklahoma and other parts of the country with fracking from natural gas. They render sites around the world useless. We're also seeing catastrophic accidents from the fossil fuels, <coughs> dinosaur fuels, oil tree explosions. Another one last week in my home state of North Dakota. Power plant fires, meltdowns. One and a half percent of nuclear power plants melt down during their lifetime. Lack of cooling water. We saw in Germany when, uh, a few years ago when there was a drought that there was inadequate water in the rivers to pump into the nuclear reactors to cool them. They had to shut them down. The wind turbines continued. During droughts, pipeline explosions, we've got all kinds of more challenges in our energy system. We have contaminated wastelands. This is all the equipment that was used when the Chernobyl reactor melted down. There's, a, there's also an equity and fairness crisis and instability in our country. Louis Brandeis is famous for saying, we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Our founding fathers deliberately constructed our Constitution to prevent massive global corporations like the East India Company and the Hudson Bay Company, which were well known in that day in the 18th century for ransacking Bangladesh for robbing blind countries around the world, the corporations that brought us the slave trade, backed by the armies of the kings and queens of Europe. And they knew that our democracy, with the idea that they had borrowed from the Iroquois, from the five nations that were in this land, they knew that those, that those um, democratic institutions they longed to build would not last in the face of global corporations backed by mercenary forces. And so they constructed corporate charters in the states where there would be greater accountability. And for example, in the state of Massachusetts, if you wanted to get a limited liability corporate charter, you only could get it for 20 years. It would automatically sunset after 20 years and you had to reapply. You had to serve the public good. You had to do something that benefited the community. And you could not lobby. You could not participate in elections. You could not be politically active if you had a limited liability corporation in the 13 original comps. <coughs> and it took, it took major corporate interests 150 years to dismantle that protection, where our democracy People haven't become any more evil than they were 10,000 years ago. People haven't become any more disastrous. They were able to function for 2 million years living in communities of 50 to 500 and not kill each other off. That's why we're here today. If competition was the most predominant part of our nature instead of, you know, if it was the dominant, we wouldn't be able to walk outside our door. But it turns out that we are hardwired, and neuroscience has shown us more and more that we are hardwired for compassion as well as competition, for collaboration as well as for mischievousness. And our founding fathers understood that you couldn't give a company unlimited liability and give them unlimited power. And what we have now is a clever manipulation of the 14th Amendment, which gave blacks the right to freedom. It got manipulated to give corporations personhood. And this personhood enables them to have higher seniority than our democracy. They have all the rights and freedoms of persons, but none of the responsibilities. And so now we find ourselves in a situation where power and money is concentrated again, like 120 years ago, when the robber barons dominated this country. And where there was an enormous gap between rich and poor. We are back into a robber baron era where we have to rebuild our democracy from the bottom up. <coughs> Wealth inequality has become worse than we ever imagined. Some of you have heard about Piketty's book on capital in the 21st century. He says, 
30 years of researching the American system, says we have worse inequality in the United States than ever existed in Europe. All the kings and queens and the hierarchies that we tried to leave behind, we now have. They've come home to roost in our own society. And during the Depression in the 1930s, we were able to get more democracy. We were able to share the wealth better. But by, by 2012, the wealthiest 160,000 families owned as much wealth as the poorest 145 million. So we are now, even Fortune magazine admitted last fall, there's plenty of evidence that shows that extreme levels of inequality is bad for business and bad for society too. We now know that the one thing that drives human beings apart faster than anything else is injustice, inequality, and lack of fairness. That is what destroys our communities. And this country was built on taking. My ancestors took land from Native peoples. My ancestors held slaves. We have had a long history of blood in this country. And that has, has kept us separated. Our immigration has kept us separated. And as a result, our pockets are now being picked. And we have a monumental challenge to come together to be one people, one nation, and one humanity to address the great inequities of our time. We also have an environmental and health crisis and challenge. We're seeing how air pollution, how toxic chemicals, how damage to ecosystems, the loss of species that provide vital functions for the biological support base that keeps everything running, the economy, our well-being, our happiness, that all of these are under threat from the burning of the dinosaur fuels. So we know that climate change is happening, and in fact, that because of all the pushback from the dinosaur corporations, that we have not been getting the story about how severe the situation is. We actually have very little time left to make the switch from coal and oil and natural gas and methane hydrates and biomass for electricity beyond anything but the tiniest use. Even nuclear power burn, uses too much, produces too much carbon emissions in the mining, the refinement, and the waste management. We are looking now to a situation, and this is Dr. James Hansen, the father of climate science. We've got to phase out coal worldwide. We've got to end deforestation and plant trees. I got eight going in my yard next week. Um, we've got to improve soils, and that means composting and building up the richness of the soil. There was a news article of a guy in California who's making $100 an acre off of four feet of composted soil. He's growing organic vegetables to sell to fancy pants restaurants in Southern California, and he's got four, they came out and measured it when they did the media story on it. Um, but he's building up that compost. All that compost can pull carbon out of the atmosphere and increase the health of our food supply. To not use much more oil and gas, and to not touch the tar sands and the oil shale. Already tar sands are providing a large, a significant percentage of the gasoline that's powering our cars. We don't need to stay with the four E's of instability of economic instability, energy instability, equity instability, and environment and health instability. We actually can shift. We have the technology now. This is from the Rodale Institute. Over 30 years of research that has been corroborated by other think tanks and universities. Organic yields are as big as conventional yields and they outperform in years of drought. Organic growing builds rather than depletes the soil. Organic growing uses 45% less energy, so it's more efficient. And conventional agriculture produces 40% more greenhouse gas emissions. And again, it's more profitable. For the first time in 110 years, we had more farmers in this country last year than we had the previous year. The potential of efficiency to help us with this problem is extraordinary. In 2003, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and their colleagues in Germany figured out that existing off-the-shelf technologies would enable Europe to cut its electricity use and all overall energy needs by two-thirds. In the US, that would translate to someplace between 60 and 85% reduction 
of our energy needs, still getting the work done using 15 to 20, 25 percent of the energy that we use now. Energy efficient technologies are just, are, they're one of the best investments you can make. This is um, a mini split heat pump that I have in my house, my award winning um, passive solar super greenhouse. It is the way of the future. You're all going to have these. We insulate our homes. We put in these electricity run. They're like a condenser on your refrigerator or air conditioner. And they are your machines. They give you for one BTU in, you get three BTUs out. It is, you take, you take heat and move it. You get heat in the winter, cool in the summer. It purifies your air and they're inexpensive to put in. These are the way of the future powered by solar and wind. <coughs> Six trillion dollars we could save if we were to insulate our homes and take advantage of all the building energy efficiency measures. Um, so, solar and wind now is now cheaper than fossil fuel, nuclear power, any other source. The price of wind and solar power has dropped so far and so fast. It is now the best investment and the best protection for our health. We now can look to an array of diverse renewable energy sources to power the world. Wind power could provide enough, the wind power the world could power everything we need seven times over. The cost of wind power is plummeting. Solar electricity could itself power the world three times over. And its cost is plummeting. The sole of the global market, according, this came out last week from Deutsche Bank, despite recent drop in oil prices, Deutsche Bank expects solar electricity to become competitive with retail electricity in an increasing number of markets globally. Even without subsidies, renewable energy is cheaper. <coughs> so decentralizing is key to the system, is a quote from your own. Um, Cuomo from New York, after Superstorm Sandy, our electrical system is archaic and obsolete. It's designed for a different time, a different place. We're going to have to look at ground and redesign. The centralized systems are vulnerable. They are not able to withstand the storm. Decentralized microgrids are the ways of the future. Energy efficient buildings, super insulation, insulating our homes. This is my little green house, most energy efficient house in the country. Cost $158,000 to build. We bought everything, renewable energy, sustainably harvested wood, non-toxic. Now it's my energy statistics in the first year. I produced two and a half times the energy I needed, enough to power a Tesla sports car, eight to 10,000 miles a year. So you get all your fuel for free. One big investment, that's my retirement plan right there. Um, growing plants everywhere. Um, changing to a multi-level transportation system like Europe and focusing on wind, concentrated solar power, tidal, and wind. I gave these talks a long time um, ago for um, a group of um, scientists at MIT and at the end a very lovely man from Africa came up to me and he said, didn't you forget one really important piece of sheer Questions for Virginia? Yes. Yeah. Do you see a demise of the large power companies like Exelon and Duke and PPL and Southern, and, or would they morph into running these microgrids? Well, you can bet that a lot of them are now shifting. And BP just quit um, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is the leading coalition for lobbying um, to keep the dinosaur fuel you know, front and center in our economy. And they just quit. And I think we're going to see more and more defections because the cost, the cost is just too high. The oil trade explosion we had last week in North Dakota, I mean, they're wanting to run 45 million barrels of oil from North Dakota and Alberta on American rail lines. Tremendous hazardous risk. People are just not going to put up with this. We are going to see this transformation. And the question is, are we going to do it in time before we get ourselves into runaway climate change? And that's now before we lose our democracy and anything left in the climate. 
I apologize, Tina. I know you said you had 33 years of nonprofit uh, work experience. Who do you work for now? I'm an independent consultant. Okay. I now just went to Durham, okay. Connecticut, okay. and Millfield, and they did. I worked at the Transition Town, which is a global movement, okay. and I'm one of their college <coughs> trainers. And oh. they did a fantastic community gathering of 100 people came together to increase community resilience. Way in the back. Hello. Um, I know you made a mention to uh, organic um, agriculture versus conventional. Would you also say like how we consume meat or like the animal agriculture industry also plays a big part in how how we use a lot of greenhouse gases through the methane and all the rest of it? Yeah. It's clear that we need animals to help us recycle the grass, the, the grasses, the uh, northern temperate ecosystem plants that we have. Um, are not in the tropics where all that biodigesting happens. So there's there's a need for ruminants in our food production system as well for the, the soil building and manure. Um, but the concentrated lots that you're referring to where we have methane massively being released into the environment. Methane is now considered to be about an 84 times greater impact on the climate than CO2 because it is hitting us at this vulnerable time where we need to get the carbon and methane out of the environment, we need to sequester again so that we don't push the global climatic system into runaway climate change. So right now, I think there's a big argument to be made for vegetarianism or at least partial vegetarianism um, and, and, and also with an eye to the small scale farms where we incorporate ruminants as part of an overall soil building program and ecosystem revival. Thank you. Um, what do you think is something like an actionable prescription that can give to the average person that they can start doing today or tomorrow that would bring them closer to living with this? I would say a few things. First, build relationships build friendships, go to therapy, work on meditation, run, jog, feed yourself healthy food, really invest in yourself and in the primary relationships in your life. Every one of us needs to have people, at least five or ten households that we can walk to within 15 minutes of where we live. When the power goes out, that you've got your emergency brothers and sisters that you can go to at 2 in the morning, no questions asked. You don't have to agree with them on politics, but you need to find the 5 to 10 people. So work on yourself and find your joy and your passion to give the world. You can make your friends by giving generously. Second, we need to rebuild our communities for our essentials, food, energy. We need to have community-supported energy like we have community-supported energy. We need to have our own food, locally owned food, our locally owned energy supplies in microgrids and nanogrids that we have control over and can then share. But we need to rebuild all those essentials of water, food, energy, and a safe, warm, and dry house for everybody in our towns. That's the community level. And then at a what I call an Oxford <coughs> regional level, that's 19th century, wherever you can haul your, your bag, of, you know, your, your cart of cabbages in a day. It's an ox cart region. You can come on boats, but someplace within about a day's travel from your home. And that's our region for economics. So we've got our emergency neighborhood, 15 minutes, our community essentials within a half hour bike ride or horseback ride or buggy ride or our regional, our Oxcart regions, our economy. And that is where we get you know, water protection, where we get larger range of resources, more diverse range of food. That's where we get our cuisine from, just like all the countries in Europe. And the final thing I would say is we have to clean house. We have to get in the game. The corporations are not human. They're the dinosaurs, and they are going to run the show if we sit on the sidelines. We have got to participate in this democracy or it's not going to be there for us. Thank you. Thank you.